Hello, everybody, and welcome to our webinar today. Um, so today we will be talking about commissioning. Uh, the title of the webinar for today is Commissioning No Longer an Option. So brief introduction into interface engineering for any of you who don't know us already. Um, we've been around for a little bit over 50 years now. Uh, office started out in Portland, Oregon. Right now we've got offices in San Francisco, Portland, Los Angeles, Honolulu, Chicago, and Washington, DC. So we are covered all around the country right now. Um, our main focus is on MEP engineering and sustainable, highly sustainable projects. Um, we offer what we like to say is everything inside the building. So we cover all MEP, fire life safety, building technologies, lighting design, energy consulting, and then what we're here today to talk about commissioning. So as I said, we focus heavily on highly sustainable buildings. That's not to say that we won't work on non or uh, non heavily sustainable projects, but we really focus on those net zeros, um, lead platinum projects. So for today's presentation, um, I will be one of our presenters. Uh, my name is Mike Fleming. I'm based out in our San Francisco office. I lead our commissioning team out here, um, both for new construction and existing building commissioning as well. And then with me today, I have Cameron Pack. Cameron, you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, thanks, Mike. Uh, so my name is Cameron Pack. Good afternoon to all of our East Coasters and good morning to our West Coasters. Um, I am uh, also have a background in mechanical engineering. I'm a professional engineer. Uh, I lead the commissioning department in our DC office. So between Michael, myself and another large group of uh, very talented individuals, we cover the entire United States plus uh, well, the continental United States plus Hawaii. I don't think we've made it up to Alaska quite yet. Um, <laughs> but we're excited to bring you a pretty interesting presentation today. So uh, today we're going to go through a brief walkthrough of the commissioning process and what codes and accreditations require it. Uh, but we're hoping to keep this brief as what we really want to discuss are the other reasons for commissioning, the benefits of commissioning. We'll do this by taking you through some typical and sometimes unique situations we experience as commissioning agents on projects. Uh, most importantly, we'll talk about how these issues could affect building occupants, owners, building staff, and the various other stakeholders involved on a project or impacted by building operation in general. Finally, we're going to finish up with some tips on how to select your commissioning authority for your project. So to start, of course, some definitions. Um, so let's start with the definition of commissioning. Commissioning is a quality focus process for enhancing the delivery of a project through document review and hands-on system verification. So what about who is a commissioning authority? Uh, they're the person or a firm responsible for the delivery of the commissioning process. Uh, this is a bit obvious. Um, I would like to add to this definition that the commissioning authority, also called commissioning agent, um, they're the owner's technical eyes and ears on the project. They're there to represent the owner's best interests from start to finish, and uh, sometimes even through occupancy of the building and throughout the entire lifespan. Now, here are some commissioning terms you may have come across. Uh, maybe you haven't. Everybody knows new construction commissioning, um, but it's sometimes not always talked about the other forms of commissioning that there can be. There's recommissioning, which is when you commission an existing building, which has been commissioned in the past previously. There's retro commissioning, which is the commissioning of an existing building, which has never been commissioned, it was missed during the start. And then finally, there's ongoing commissioning. Um, this is the cyclical commissioning of a building throughout its lifespan. Um, all of these fall under the existing building commissioning umbrella. So I'm going to get started talking about the actual commissioning process. 
so as we said, we don't want to go too much into walking everyone through each individual step of commissioning, um, since that's not the goal of this project. And hopefully all of you guys have been through the process before. But what we really want to focus on is really how commissioning is and should be part of the project right from the beginning all the way to the end. And how in the optimal commissioning process, commissioning authority is involved during pre-design right from the beginning, right from the infancy of a project when we're really just talking about what the hopes and dreams of a project is. And then carrying through into the design um, into design phase reviews, making sure that those hopes and dreams are carried forward, uh, making sure that pen goes to paper and that everything that's supposed to be there is included in that design. Um, we carry through into construction, once again, making sure now what's on paper is actually out in the field, is gained and installed, and then into our actual acceptance where we're functionally testing, making sure that everything's working correctly. And then the final piece of the puzzle is really making sure that commissioning stays involved into post acceptance, into occupancy, and seeing how the building really operates once it's being occupied, once um, things are getting fine tuned, once the setting set points are getting adjusted, so that the project can continue to operate as intended for the life of the project and the life of the building. So let's get started on the why commissioning is not optional, at least from the point of view of code requirements. At this point in time, as you can see from the map that we've got up here, the majority of the country right now is following the 2018 IECC. And as part of IECC, pretty much any new construction that's greater than 10,000 square feet is going to require some amount of commissioning. Um, California, not included in this nice big green map, has their own that's even more stringent in the energy code side that once again still includes commissioning as well. The other trigger that you're going to see when it comes to commissioning is any lead project um, as fundamental commissioning is a prerequisite for any new construction lead building. So. At this point in time, there's very few projects that aren't going to have commissioning as a requirement. But that's not the goal of our presentation. What we want to talk about is why you should be doing commissioning, even if you don't have to because of the code. And we really want to focus on why it's not optional for the benefit of the project and why it's not just a checkbox on the code saying that you did it but where the real value add benefits come from. So to get started, um, energy costs are usually one of the biggest goals or one of the biggest savings that comes out of the commissioning process. Um, a non-commissioned project will typically not meet the goals that were in the design, um, that were in the original energy model. And in some cases it can be as great as 50% energy reduction and bringing it back down to where it should be after going through the commissioning process. On top of that, there's the added savings from maintenance costs by ensuring that systems operate correctly right from the beginning and ensuring that there is the ability to maintain the equipment after the commissioning process is complete. So overall, this results in a fairly large operating cost for the building, whether it be through energy, whether it be through maintenance costs, or whether it be through anything else associated with the building. On top of that, there's the harder to quantify numbers, but some of these come from uncomfortable building occupants, um, unproductive employees. If people are tired all the time, if people are getting sick more often because the building's HVAC isn't working correctly, companies have lost productivity from that. And then finally, there's the overworked facility staff who are just putting out fires all the time um, in order to make the building operate as opposed to actually doing what they should be doing in order to keep things running smoothly. And sometimes from commissioning process, we just fix stupid little things. So in this case, we have a nice little cloud in the sky that got installed or got wrongly installed because of a cloud on a drawing. So Sometimes they're funny little things, but 
a lot of the savings that we do find are very large uh, operational issues as well. So what we want to do in this presentation is sort of walk through the process, but with the point of view of talking about the specific issues that we've run into in the past and specific ways about how we are able to improve the entire construction or the desire entire project life cycle. So our project, our commissioning project here starts in the pre-design phase. And one of the biggest items that comes out of pre-design is an owner's project requirement document. Now this is a document that far too often gets omitted or gets skipped over um, either by a team that's just not familiar with it or from a team that just wants to hit the ground running very quickly and may not have the time or the thought to go into creating this document. Now, in many ways, the owner's project requirement document is the foundation of any good project, of any successful project, because it provides the team with a roadmap of how they are going to get to a successful project how are we going to document what are the most important needs for the projects and what are the like to haves um, as the project's going to go through there no doubt will be ve processes there will be design changes and the goal of documenting these important needs for a project allows us to ensure that as changes are being made we can refer back and ensure that we're not losing the main goals of the project and we're not losing what the owner intended to be part of it. So this is always a good foundation to the project. Not too long ago, I was involved in a project with a large multinational pharmaceutical company. And I sat down with their construction team late in the design process. And we had a conversation about an OPR. We helped them to develop an OPR late in design and they were blown away by the fact that they had been on projects all around the world building large-scale projects and had never sat down to do this process um, and they walked away from the meeting being saying that it is now going to be a general step and an automatic as part of every one of their projects because it opened their eyes that we were at the end of construct or end of the design phase and they still couldn't answer some of the questions that we were asking. And they hadn't even thought about some of the basic answers or the basic questions of how the building is gonna be used and how it's gonna be operated. So having that discussion early on, making sure to get the operations team, the facilities people, the people who are actually gonna be utilizing and maintaining the building involved in this conversation will help to lead towards a very successful project. Thanks, Michael. I can't harp on this enough. When a solid OPR is done at the beginning, the whole project just seems to go so much smoother. Um, I had seen that there uh, that there may have had some people that uh, noted I was having audio issues. Michael, are you, are you still noticing that? Sounding better now. OK, good to hear. And let's keep moving. So. If everything has gone well, the commissioning authority has a seat at the table early in the design phase. Throughout this phase, we are reviewing the design team's plans to ensure compliance with the OPR, code requirements, and industry best practices. Now, there's a number of issues we are typically looking for, and I have some examples for you here. Pressurization. Now, surprisingly, one of the most common issues I find is the designer forgets to install a physical safety on the air handling unit to prevent the fan from over or under pressurizing a ductwork system. Typically, this occurs when the startup technician or even the building engineer manually controls the fan but forgets to open or close the airflow dampers, giving the air nowhere to go. Excuse my poor graphics. Pressure builds and builds until either the ductwork seems burst or the fan fails. The building engineer could be controlling the system from their office in the basement and they would have no idea until they go up and investigate. Uh, this can obviously result in some huge delays during construction and even more major issues for building owners if this happens when the building is occupied. The fix is, of course, pretty easy. Uh, it's a pressure safety device which will physically kill the power the fan if the safe pressure range is exceeded. 
An additional precaution is to install a sensor to confirm your dampers are open before enabling the fan. However, this can be overridden, so we do always recommend the safety switch. Uh, Michael here has actually encountered this issue firsthand in the field, though I don't believe we were given the opportunity to do a design review in your case, right, Michael? Yeah, so there was one project that we worked on a couple of years back that we got involved after the design reviews had already been complete, and we were just on board for the construction phase. And this came up as a sort of unplanned circumstance that um, towards the end of construction, the building that we were working on actually had a unplanned electrical outage. And what was discovered in this case was the generator came on as it was supposed to, the air handler continued to run um, and worked as intended. However, all of the terminal units, the VAV boxes down in the zone, we discovered were not actually on emergency power. So the controls closed all these boxes down. And since our commissioning process and our testing process had not yet been completed, this high limit safety switch um, was not set at the right point and wasn't or wasn't working correctly yet. And in this case, what actually happened was the supply fan ramped up to 100%, overpressurized the duct and actually exploded one of the ducts right in the main riser somewhere around the second or third floor in a medical building. So obviously at this time it required a lot of extra work as they now had to replace ductwork inside of the main riser shaft, um, which was obviously an unplanned um, hope for what was going to happen at that point as they were getting towards the end and trying to hit occupancy goals. So the importance of this and Luckily, in our case, it happened while we were still in construction and still in commissioning, but this is not something that you want to happen during a regular emergency or during regular operation. And something that likely wouldn't have been caught if they weren't doing commissioning on the project. Um, so it's, it's a good thing that you're there involved in that. So uh, another seemingly simple issue that I encounter is sweating diffusers. And uh, these two images are pretty gross, but typically this occurs when supplier diffusers are close to a source of humid air, uh, most commonly an exterior door or operable window, um, especially here in DC during the swampy summers. Other causes can be issues resulting in lower than expected air temperatures um, that are caused by airflow issues uh, in the system itself, and that results in condensation on the ducts and diffusers. Regardless, the last thing anybody wants is mold and water damage in their brand new pretty building. So during design reviews, we call out diffusers in precarious locations where this may occur. In some cases, we recommend window or door switches to disable the AC units while the doors or windows are open. In more extreme cases, modifications to the control suite sequence or mechanical equipment selection is recommended. These precautions typically protect us from this messy situation during startup and operation. Ventilation. Ventilation is, is a big topic right now uh, amongst the HVAC community, especially in regards to COVID-19 mitigation in buildings. Uh, actually, you may have heard about it as a part of one of our other webinars installations that was done by uh, Joe Diano from our DC office. Uh, if you haven't, definitely check it out on our website. It was, uh, it's pretty interesting. Anyway, I digress. Uh, this situation is not a story about the benefits of ventilation, but rather the dangers if it is not properly monitored and controlled. This happened in a retro commissioning project uh, for an office building uh, in Washington C in DC. In order to improve indoor air quality, the building had just upgraded their rooftop ventilation fans to increase the volume of outside air being delivered into the building. Typically, we recommend a dedicated outside air unit to treat this incoming air, uh, especially if there's an exhaust air post stream where we can steal um, some energy from uh, via an energy recovery wheel uh, and thus increase the efficiency of the project. However, on this specific project, this option wasn't in the budget. So raw outside air, hot and humid during the summer, rigid during the winter is delivered directly to the mechanical room via these risers that run 
the height of the building. Uh, the outside air is then mixed with return air and treated by the air handling units located in the mechanical room. Uh, the ventilation system project was technically outside the scope of our retro commissioning project. However, uh, as it was happening simultaneously that we were doing our other testing in the building, we wanted to weigh in on the design. So dampers were to be installed in each mechanical room. The sequence called for them to open and close based on whether or not the air handling unit was enabled. This is a great way to save fan energy in general. But reading further into the sequence, the designer called for the rooftop ventilation fan to control it to its speed to a static set point just below a duct's pressure rating. And for the mechanical room dampers to open fully during operation. So for those that aren't um, typically involved in controls, controlling to just below the duct pressure rating is, is fairly unusual. You usually want to have a, um, a test and balance contractor determine the appropriate set point for you so that you're providing the optimal amount of air. But seeing the sequence, some alarm bells went out. This, out, this raw outside air, uh, it was dumping into an occupied building uh, with seemingly no steps being taken to ensure that that volume of air could be properly treated by the air handling system. Basically, they were going to overwhelm the system, was my concern, and that they weren't going to be able to meet all the required set points. So I brought this issue up. There's um, and what followed was a series of back and forth conversations with the design team. At one point, the system was actually installed and turned over for operation. It took less than a week, then a hot summer day came along and the air in the building was nice and thick and warm. Lots of occupant complaints. Um, there are obvious signs of thermal comfort and humidity issues. At this point, they had to shut the system down <clears throat> and, or dial it back, way back. And we finally got back to the table and got our way. Uh, the system airflow was balanced to the appropriate outside airflow rates to match what the air handling units could handle. And um, we're currently still working with the building now, and this issue appears to be closed. So, all right, enough about design. Let's get into construction. So hopefully going through the pre-design and the design phase, um, you've been able to see the important items that really can come out of a quality strong commissioning process. The construction phase is typically what most people think of when they think of commissioning. This is going out, this is ensuring that what's on the plans gets implemented actually out in the field. But where I'm going to start is even before the field component of it, and it's getting into the submittal process. And one of the most important submittals in the commissioning agent process is the control submittal. And this is where we actually learn how the system is going to operate, how equipment is gonna operate and ensure that it's gonna meet the owner's project requirement. Now, far too often we get documents separate, we get equipment already being approved without knowing how it's going to be controlled, uh, especially on design build projects when the schedule is tight and things are just moving along out in the field in order to try to meet very challenging milestones and goals for the project. In some cases, things will get installed out in the field prior to them being approved and in some cases equipment's going out there before we really have an idea of how it's going to be operated. So one of the most important items for a commissioning process is a strong detailed control submittal and making sure that it gets improved. We had one project which was a city hall project here in California and in order to meet tight schedules the controls contractor had begun installing their hardware prior to the point of it getting approved. Since we were heavily involved in the commissioning process and holding regular meetings with the team, we kept prodding them to ensure that they were submitting a submittal, um, ensuring that it was getting approved, ensuring that they were making the, 
revisions and addressing comments both from ourselves and from the mechanical engineer of record. In this case, because they had moved ahead or hadn't documented what they were doing before they were actually putting it out into the field, we hit a point where things started having to get ripped out um, because what they had put in was not going to work for the equipment that was being installed because it didn't match the design documents and it wasn't going to be a workable system for the owner to be able to operate and maintain. In this specific instance, the controls contractor then tried to back charge the owner um, for the rework that they had to do even though the rework was entirely their own fault because they had begun to install things prior to getting approval for it. So in this case, the commissioning team was able to push heavily there and defend the owner to ensure that they weren't going to get charged for something that was not on any of the design project team, but was entirely on the construction side. So from our point of view, ensuring that we're on top of things, ensuring that we're holding the entire project team accountable is really one of the big components and one of the big additional benefits that comes out of a strong commissioning process. This is a favorite one of mine. Debris and the ductwork are in the fan compartment. Whether by mistake or on purpose, control the contractors love to leave debris inside of stuff. I'm not sure why. Typically it ranges from plastic bags to spare parts to instruction manuals. Um, it's unfortunate to say, but I, I find this issue on more than half of the projects I work on. This is, of course, after startup, after the contractor has told me the system is ready to hand over to the owner. Actually, uh, I just bought a house a few months ago, um, a new homeowner. And of course, as an engine nerd and uh, commissioning agent, uh, the first thing I do is go stick my head in every nook and cranny of the house. Well, I'm checking out my furnace and lo and behold, there is an instruction manual, a large plastic bag and a set of three 24 inch pipes sitting right next to the blower inside of the unit. It was a, it was a great find. Um, anyway, best case scenario is the cerebrix and obnoxious noise keeping building occupants up at night or giving them something to complain to building engineering. Worst case scenario is it gets lodged into your fan motor and causes some serious damage, smoke, fire, nothing anybody wants. For this reason, we always make sure to stick our heads into the nooks and crannies just to double check. The, fan, the photo on the right here was actually an example of a project that was, once again, trying to get approval for occupancy so that people could move in. And what was happening was they were not able to eat, meet their airflow set points. And this became a process of back and forth of blaming the engineer for incorrectly sizing a fan, um, for then going back and blaming the contractor for incorrectly installing it. But in the end, what it came down to to this photo on the right was simply a bag stuck in the bird screen um stopping and adding extra resistance and stopping the fan from performing the way that it was so in this case luckily it was a very simple fix but something that had still been missed um, by multiple other sets of eyes that was getting in the way of allowing occupancy for this project so our next pro example here is going a little bit deeper into the weeds. And this is really an example of how, in my mind, sometimes commissioning can be a mystery. It's an investigation. It's going through and trying to find the root cause of really where a prod problem or an issue comes from. This specific example is from a middle school in Hawaii. And we were in the middle of the commissioning process and we had, in this case, it was a science classroom that things just weren't working quite right. We didn't quite know what the issue was, but we could tell that something wasn't working right. So this began months before um, they were trying to get their occupancy. And when we were just doing some preliminary spot checks and testing. And the way that this room is designed 
is that we have air coming into the space with a fan coil unit providing conditioned air. But because it's a science classroom, at the teacher's desk, there is a switch that allows for an exhaust fan to turn on so that they can exhaust any little experiment that they might be doing at the front of the classroom. However, when that switch is tripped on, the intent is that these control dampers open up to allow air to come in so that we don't change the pressure of the room. And we allow for this just as much air to come in as is being exhausted by this fan. So when we were on site early on, we did a spot check and we turned the exhaust fan on and we discovered that no air was coming in through this controlled damper. So we brought this up to the mechanical contractor and said, alerted to them that the motorized damper probably wasn't wired correctly or wasn't working correctly just yet. A couple months later, when the project was ready for turnover, we came back in and we repeated the same test and all worked well. We turned the exhaust fan on, we checked, and there was air coming in through the damper. So all was good. However, we then turned the fan back off. And in this instance, we noticed that air was now leaving the room through this area. So this damper was supposed to close automatically when the exhaust fan was not on. What we discovered was in their attempt to try to fix the initial issue, they had utilized a sheet metal screw to just force the damper to be automatically opened and it would be open 100% of the time. What this did was it allowed the air to come into the space and then immediately go out through the damper, meaning we were wasting energy by cooling down a space that was then just releasing air right back outside. So we told them to make this change. And what we then discovered was they had not installed an actual motorized control damper. Instead, they had installed just a backdraft damper and not adjusted the weight on it. So what happened in this case was if the fan coil unit was on, then it would overpressurize the room and the doors to the space would not close because the pressure inside the room was too high. Now, what this does is presents a safety concern that you have a middle school where the door might not close. So now you have a locked door that might not close overnight. It might not close in the case of a lockdown. And there's all sorts of safety concerns that come from a door that cannot close on its own. Additionally, you have the operational issues and the energy savings of now losing air through the space and not being able to properly control the space overall. So in the end, because of the investigation that we did into something as little as transfer air through a duct, we were able to determine that the contractor had installed the wrong damper, um, incorrectly installed the damper that they did install, and then got them to make the fix prior to students being in the space to ensure that we can actually get adequate pressurization, comfort, and not have humidity issues by having hot, humid air constantly coming in through this ductwork into the space as well. You know, Michael, actually, it's funny. I, I recently read uh, about a very similar case of this, but it was a hotel where raw ventilation air was being delivered to fan coil units in each room. The room was damp and the furniture was growing mold on it. Obviously, nothing you want in a hotel room. Uh, so that the fan coil units only operated to maintain the space temperature, but the ventilation system was running 24-7, pushing whatever was outside into that room. No, de no dehumidification unless the fan coil unit was running. Uh, that problem was solved with a control damper and an occupancy sensor, somewhat similar to the situation, and no more humidity issues. So after we move into construction, we then move into the acceptance phase. Now the acceptance phase is where we test, functionally test all the equipment, where we walk through every component of the sequence of operations, every component of how equipment is supposed to operate and test it to ensure that it's going to operate the way it is intended. For the next project example that we have here, we focus on a community college project 
um, that was very a very complex design. And this project was a net zero project, um, lead platinum. And where we ran into issues, we lost a slide here, but I'll keep talking, um, is in the photo, we can see the example of, where did I go? Um, in the example, we had condensation on the floors, um, we had stuffy classrooms, and what this actually led to was a drop in enrollment in the project in the actual community college. So we got involved about a year after the space had been occupied. Cameron, you want to pull the slides back up here? Yeah, sorry, it should be showing right now. Did it did it drop off? Yeah, we can just see the main first slide in your PowerPoint screen right now. Oh, interesting. My mistake. How about now? There we go. Better. So the way that this specific project was designed was almost like a living, breathing building. Um, we used utilized natural ventilation coming from above the windows through natural ventilation terminals and that pull and had exhaust fans in this main school's atrium allowing the exhaust fan to suck air through the atrium, through the classrooms from the outside to provide natural air and fresh air into the building. From there, we use radi radiant heating and cooling slabs to be able to provide our conditioning to make the space comfortable. When we got, first got involved on the commissioning side of things, it was about a year into occupancy and they had received nothing from complaints about the building. From pretty much a couple months in, teachers were leaving doors open to try to get air in. They were putting big fans, both in the fans, both in the doorways leading to the hallways and also doorways leading to the outside and just constantly having issues to the point that they were actually getting drop in enrollment in the classes that took place in this building. And to the point that I was on site during a graduation ceremony where you had parents leaving the actual graduation, walking out the door, sweating just to go back in, having loud fans in each doorway just to try to get air into it. And overall, it was just a non-usable space. What we discovered coming in rather quickly, we started our investigation on the radiant floor side of things. And we discovered a slew of sensors that were miscalibrated, um, both in the slab and temperature sensors that just weren't set up correctly, along with controls logic that wasn't making sense for the equipment that was installed. A radiant system is inherently slow to react as you need to heat up an entire floor slab or cool it down in order to meet the conditioning. But the controls were set up to be quick reacting, similar to a VAV system. So what this resulted in was condensation on the floor in some cases, where the janitors would have to come in and mop up um, wet spots on the floors, and would also result in just uncomfortable spaces. On top of that, we had natural ventilation terminals that were out of control. They would only open if once the room had gotten stuffy, and not provide ventilation when the room was just comfortable. And this just became a headache right from the beginning. So our team got involved in this project that, as I said, had already been in operation for over a year. And all these headaches, all these energy costs, all of these issues from a building that was supposed to be net zero, from a building that had gone through the lead system in order to be a platinum project, so without the missing pieces of commissioning, this project just was not workable. So it's a perfect example that even the best design does not just mean that the project is going to occur the way it's intended to, and that all those energy savings and occupancy comfort items will automatically occur. Luckily for us, we were able to get involved in this. We were able to help the project get back on track and now the project is under yearly monitoring um, through a monitoring-based commissioning process to track energy to make sure that things continue to operate. And we've actually implemented a far 
more intelligent controls system than was originally in place. So in the last step of our commissioning process is post acceptance. And this is continuing on in the project. So just like the college that we had talked about, this is making sure that as the space is occupied, we continue to see those lasting savings. We continue to see that the way the building is operating, once everyone moves in, still matches the way it was supposed to. So I'm gonna start off here and just say, we're engineers, we love data. We're very few people who probably get excited when we look at squiggly lines like what we see on the right here. But we get excited because it allows us to find answers or it allows us to find problems that we can solve. And really that's what engineers love to do is to solve problems. So in this case, what we had on the right hand side of this screen, it's not something major to see, but what we can see here is that on the weekends, during unoccupied operation, these spaces were getting very hot to the point that some rooms were hitting almost 90 degrees when there was, uh, when on the weekends when the systems were off. Now this might not seem like a big issue, but even during unoccupied hours, we want to ensure that our spaces stay at least relatively comfortable. First of all, for janitorial staff or anyone else who might be in the space, even though it is not considered to be during regular occupancy hours. For this specific project, it was a city hall and it really would have sucked if the mayor of the town was in there working on the weekend and it was 90 degrees in their space. So I would assume that anyone on our client side or anyone on the project team would fairly quickly hear about this problem if it was the wrong person who happened to be in the space. So what we discovered in this case was, while there was logic implemented to turn on the equipment and have it maintain a comfortable temperature during those unoccupied hours, what actually happened was that was only applicable to half the spaces. And the logic that they had implemented did not include it for every part of the building. So in this case, because of our trend review, we were able to quickly look through about a week's worth of data for every part of the building and be able to see that one half was not included in this logic. So in this case, we were able to resolve that shortly after the building had been occupied. And that way we can now have a comfortable environment for that hard working mayor who wants to be in there on a Saturday working away to try to make the city better. Thanks, Michael. I, I'm not gonna lie, I do really love the squiggly line trend data. It is, uh, it's a fun part of commissioning. All right, so we've only got uh, a little bit of time left here, but we wanna take you through some quick hits, some stuff that we see uh, from time to time, definitely uh, stuff that we wanna point out. So the first one here is garage lighting controls. Um, them being off at night. So it's great for energy savings, but not for occupant safety. The system is tested by the contractor during the day, but then when we come in for testing, we find that the time schedule is incorrect or the photo sensor is located near another light. Um, these are all quick fixes, but certainly not something you wanna deal with once the building is already occupied. Next is Going back to ventilation, uh, besides COVID-19, there is increasing evidence of the importance of indoor air quality on occupant health and happiness. Both LEED and WELL make a big deal about this. Uh, a big impact, of course, on indoor quality is ventilation. Time and time again on projects, I find ventilation dampers closed during occupied hours. Uh, typically, this is occurring on uh, existing buildings that have been running for quite a while. And usually it's a fix by the building engineer to solve heating and cooling issues in the building. Unfortunately, this is not the correct answer. When I find this, we open the dampers back up and then we start looking into what the real problem actually is. But it's certainly an issue that we don't want to forget about.
Uh, the next item that we have here um, is something as simple as a booster pump. This is just bringing wa city water and giving it an extra push so that it can actually go up into the high rise buildings or into spaces that um, just need the extra pressure. In this case, one of the examples that we saw was an incorrect set point during the initial startup resulted in a booster pump that would just run continuously. The obvious issue here is the energy costs and that now you have a pump that's running 24 seven instead of really only running about 10 to 15% of the time under a typical operation. Additionally, under this situation, it was to the point that the pump was running so often and deadheading since there was no flow in the system that our domestic cold water was now upwards of almost 90 degrees in some instances just because of the heat that was being produced by this pump running and running and running when there is no flow. The next quick example we've got here is talking about irrigation. Now it might seem to be something very simple, but it is something that can get overlooked quite often. And here we have a picture that I will say is luckily of the building next door to a project that I'm working on. But this project was built and designed with a beautiful green roof. And here we have a picture less than a year after the building was turned over and complete and the entire roof had died and needed to be replanted and reset up. So it was an irrigation system that just was an afterthought or didn't get installed correctly. And if you actually look very closely in the top of this picture, you can see a bunch of dead trees as well that shows where the irrigation just did not work correctly from day one and resulted in a loss of one of the very major features of this project. And the final example that I've got is sometimes what is on paper has to work around things and actual conditions out on site can change the routing of duct work quite a bit. In this case, we see a very what was probably drawn up as a very straight duct resulting in all these extra elbows all these little turns and curves and switchbacks and what actually happened in this situation was this was meant to be an exhaust system for a refrigerant monitoring system in a chiller room now, this is a life safety system that when there is a refrigerant leak this kicks on in full to exhaust the air and make this space safe for someone who might be in there but in this case, because of this routing of the ductwork, they were not able to meet the design requirements of this fan and therefore would not have been able to safely exhaust air from this space in case of an emergency. Now, hopefully this is a type of system that will never operate and especially not with someone in the room when it happens. But this is not the type of system that we want to find out doesn't work correctly when that emergency does happen. I was just thinking about this, Mike. This uh, this looks like when I play Tetris, and I am not very good at Tetris. <laughs> All right, uh, I will round it off here. So PVC pipe support. Um, this is a big one on all projects, but especially for multifamily projects. When pipes are not properly supported, the weight of each of the components is directly on the fitting. Um, which then fail, and now you have a huge mess. So your building is ready in completion, you're almost ready to go, and the pipe fails in one of your units, all of a sudden every other unit below it needs uh, water remediation and you're behind schedule. It is the last thing anybody wants. So we make sure to always check this during our inspections and catch it uh, as early as possible if there is an issue. So hopefully at this point, we've convinced you all of the importance um, and the value add that comes from commissioning um, and why it is not should not be considered an optional service or something that's just completed because of code requirements. So then the next item that we're going to briefly just touch on at the end here is how do you choose someone who's going to lead this process? How do you choose your commissioning authority for the project? So what's most important, and it comes down to experience and ensuring that you're choosing someone who's got experience in the building type that you're working on, 
as well as the equipment that you're working on. Um, there are no doubt many commissioning authorities out there who might be experts in hospitals, but may not be able to apply that same expertise to a lab building instead. Um, or maybe experts in air handling units with VAV boxes, but not experts in radiant flooring. So ensuring that they are familiar, not only in the type of building, but in the type of equipment that's being used is of utmost importance in ensuring that you get the most quality value added benefits from a commissioning process as you can. And additionally, making sure um, that they are accredited or that they are, they've been through the project on many occasions. So there are many different accreditations out there for commissioning, whether it be the BCXA, um, whether it be ACG's commissioning group, um, there are many different options out there, but really making sure that you've got a dedicated commissioning expert on the project helps to ensure that the process is as smooth as possible. And then finally, as commissioning moves forward, as more and more code compliance leads the commissioning process to be required on projects, we get commoditization of the trade. And this helps to really focus on where you need that strong expertise. We, the goal of this presentation is really to focus on and hopefully convince you all that commissioning is a value added process. Um, voluntary desired commissioning is the best option and it should not just be seen as a checkbox or something that must be done in order to get occupancy or to get through code compliance. We want to really focus on a differentiated value added commissioning process that brings value to the project. And at this point, that is the end of our presentation. Uh, hopefully you guys learned a lot about the commissioning process and some of the added value that can come out of it. And at this point, we are open for any questions. It looks like we've got a question here from Lisa about the Fifth Hope co College project. She asked, how much was the original design of the control design programming and how much was just bad installation slash field programming? So I guess design versus construction, what were the, what were the causes there? So in this case, what caused at least one of the big headaches um, was the VE process. And what had actually happened was the natural ventilation terminals were originally designed with the manufacturer um, providing its own controls and then the main building controls just having to send set points to it. But as a way of trying to cut costs, the proprietary manufacturer's controls were replaced by the building management system but the BMS didn't, I guess, know the full depth of the sequence of operations and provided controllers that just weren't able to do what was intended from the beginning. So this leads back to sort of that conversation on the owner's project requirements um, and really making sure that the goals are clearly aligned. And as you go through VE, as you go through design, that the entire process and what's these goals are clearly documented so that when you go through VE, you can quickly see, are we losing any of this operation? Um, some of the other issues definitely did come up in construction um, and were just things that might not have been caught or weren't tested thoroughly enough um, during the original construction process. Yeah, this made me think of another project that I was doing. It was a, a lab, a uh, manufacturing facility for a pharmaceutical company. And uh, the, the rooms were rated anywhere between ISO 6 and ISO 8 with very strict pressure cascade requirements. Um, and similarly, the uh, original airflow dampers that were used to control the amount of exhaust and supply air going into each of the rooms was VE'd out and uh, a different control, uh, actuator was installed 
we ran into the exact same problem. The BMS didn't have the ability to control the actuators uh, at an appropriate rate to maintain pressurization. And it created about a month's worth of, of uh, balancing issues and control tuning uh, in order to, for us to get it right, but eventually it happened. So that's the that's the only question we've received so far. If anybody has any other questions, um, please feel free to drop them into the question box. Uh, I guess while we wait, Michael, do you want to talk about what our next upcoming webinar is? Yeah, so we definitely uh, want would like you guys to join our next webinar, which will be taking place on Wednesday, October 20th. Uh, this is going to be a presentation from Steve Gross in our office, as well as Christopher Galarza, um, who's an expert in energy electrification of commercial kitchens. So this presentation is going to be on sustainable food services and the introduction of induction cooking um, to replace gas on uh, commercial kitchens, restaurants, anything like that. So. I know that these two are actually presenting together at Greenbuild um, this week as well. So definitely look forward to that webinar um, to learn about electrification. Very exciting. Definitely interested to see what comes out of Greenbuild this year as well. Um, I only received one more question. Well, thank you to Claudia Latimer. Thank you for the thank you. And uh, Jeff, um, we have recorded this presentation and we will be posting it on our webpage. Uh, there should be a follow-up email um, and you can find, I believe, all of our previous webinars on our page. So please feel free to look it up when it's posted um, and check out some of the previous ones as well. With that, uh, I'd like to thank everybody for joining us today. Um, I hope everybody enjoys the rest of your day. And if you have any additional questions about commissioning, please feel free to reach out to uh, myself or Michael or any of your other contacts in Interface Engineering. We'd be happy to help. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, all. Have a great day.